Quran says and the Bible says, if the original Injil, the revelation which was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it was sent as a guidance. So what is mentioned, you have to follow it. Yes, there may be certain times that there may be other meanings which may also be right. But that does not mean what is the normal meaning that should not be taken. Yes, brother. Like, for example, um, you were quoting uh, Leviticus about the, like, the clothing for, in Christianity. Um, but in the later teachings, uh, Jesus talks about just being modest and be modest for yourself. And so that a Christian would take not the literal meaning of you need to cover up, you need to not have the loose clothing, but just say that in modern society, it's a different idea that modesty isn't the same. Very good. See, I like, I really like your question. If you ask me a question, and I'll clarify you, I'll try my level best. The brother has given an example that when I talk about Leviticus, I didn't quote Leviticus, I quoted Deuteronomy chapter number 22, verse number 5, etc., which talks about modesty, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 9, even 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 5 to 7, modesty. What now, brothers, I don't tell me that what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, told that you have to be modest. But what he meant was not literally about the clothes, but just modest in society. That is your understanding of the Bible. Let's see what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 70 to 20, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Until the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and teach men should do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep the commandments and teach the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a verbatim quotation from King James Version. I'm speaking from my head. It's a verbatim quotation from King James Version, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20. So Jesus Christ says that even if you break one jot or tittle from the law, from the Old Testament, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So when the Old Testament says, the woman shall not wear clothes that would pertain to a man, and a man shall not wear clothes that would pertain to woman. Now tell me, brother Zakir, that's the literal sense. Now the society is changing. So Jesus Christ said, peace be upon him, if you break one law, jot or tittle, you shall not enter Jannah. Now do you mean to say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came to misguide us? Not at all. He clearly said that until the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass away until all be fulfilled. Did later on the teaching of Paul, St. Paul who is the self-appointed apostle of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he tells us, that see, the law is nailed to the cross. That is his teaching. It's not the teaching of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Who do you believe? In Jesus Christ, peace be upon him or St. Paul? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him said that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, unless you are better than the Jews, you shall not enter Jannah. That means everything what is mentioned in the Old Testament, not to have pork, you have to be modest, has to be followed. That's the reason if you go, the nuns, the nuns, they are dressed up like the Muslima. Have you seen the photograph of Mother Mary? She is completely covered. Her head is covered. Up to the wrist. Up to the ankle. I am sure in future you may have, God knows, Mother Mary may be wearing skirts. That is a later development. But the true photograph, if you analyze, same thing with the nuns. The nuns are properly covered. Why? So in Islam, every Muslima is a nun. Every Muslima, in terms of piety, she has to be passed, she has to be modest. So what I'm telling that if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. Yes, brother. Well, how the question um, was supposed to be about how uh, modern societies interprets these, modern, these religions and incorporates them into our you know, society. So if we're interpreting them not as a literal sense, we're going to listen, like the scripture you quoted, it, it would just say, it would be how you feel that Jesus meant by that saying, which would be that we should follow the teachings of the Old Testament, and maybe not literally, and we should think about what he means by the laws of what to wear. So when he says, follow all this or you can't go to heaven, it, we, modern person 
after the Reformation would think would be that it's what it, he interprets Whether it as. Whether if I agree with you that in every modern age we try and reinterpret, then what is the use of the Bible? What is the use of the Quran? If you're going to reinterpret, keep on reinterpreting into modern age and what the modern society believes, you're going to put the Bible into that shell. So what is the use of the Bible then? Why do you require the Bible? Why do you require what you can say that if science and technology advance, you can understand the Bible better, understand the Quran better, I've got no objection. But if you tell me, depending how the modern society behaves, you have to reinterpret the Quran or the Bible, it is totally nonsense. God is our creator. He knows what is best for us. Do you mean to say that God did not know? You are limiting God. That means you are trying to tell me that God did not know that the society is going to change. If you analyze the Quran, Though it was revealed 1400 years ago, you cannot point out a single verse of the Quran which is against modern established science. Do you know that? However much the science has established, however much the science advances, it will never be able to prove even a single verse wrong. Yes, it will be able to give a new dimension. When science advances, maybe we will be able to understand that aspect of Quran better. Today, with our limited knowledge of science, we may not be able to understand certain verses of the Quran. But that does not mean you are giving a new look depending upon how the modern society is developing. Modern society, however much it develops, the law will be the same. The woman should be in hijab. The man should lower his gaze. It's not like Canada. Now a man can marry a man. In Islam, we don't believe in majority. We believe in truth. Truth prevails, haq prevails. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Seek the truth, and the truth shall free you. We don't believe in democracy that today you say, Okay, fine, gay marriages are fine. And today you say that modesty, fine, a woman can wear less clothes. See, that is the man made law. The person who has created us, Almighty God, He knows what is good and what is bad for us. Therefore, religion means a way of life. So we follow the guidance given by a creator, then only we'll be on the true path. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Aisha. I'm from Philippines. I born Christian. Now, I am just a Muslim one year. I have two. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I would like to point out two things actually. The first thing is I observe that most of us Muslims, they, uh, they strikes or we speak about the weaknesses of other religions. Why don't we show the good things as the models against them? Like what I've heard in this session, that we are more better than Christians. I am right now studying in Islamic Center, and according to our some teachers, they said that no one in the world can judge a person. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say that his heart is good, he is good. No one can judge in the world. What do you think about it? Sister, has the question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the only one who can judge the hearts, and I do agree with you. She is saying that why do we say that we are better? We should present what is good. Sister, what I did in this talk, is I picked up the good things of Christianity. I'm trying to tell the Christians that actually if you follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is good. I'm trying to uplift them. I'm not trying to degrade them. You have misunderstood my talk. What I'm trying to say when I made the statement that if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we are more Christian than the Christian themselves. Trying to tell verse of the Quran, Come to common terms as I and you. I never said that we are better. We are following your Bible better. I am saying. I am telling them that why don't you follow your Bible also? At least follow what is common. I am trying to pick up the good points of the Bible. That if your Bible says that be modest, the woman should cover the head. That the woman should bear the veil. The woman should be modest. I'm telling them, why aren't you modest? Where am I trying to prove that we are better than them? I'm trying to say that at least let us agree to follow what is common. Again, this is not my technique. It is what our creator Allah has told us. It is not my style. Allah is telling me to do this. 
If you say it is wrong, then you are telling Allah is wrong. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, Ta'ala vila kalmitin sawa imbarin amainakum. Come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abuda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So we have to convey the message to the non-Muslims that come to common terms and the best term is that worship only one God. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Uh, good evening, doctor. I'm Rob from Philippines. I just want to know, I just want to be clarified about the role of Ismail, the son of Abraham in Islam. Brother, the question that what is the role of Ismail, may peace be upon him, in Islam? We believe that Ismail, peace be upon him, was the son of Abraham. He is not only mentioned in the Quran, he is even mentioned in the Bible. The Bible and the Quran, it does mention that Abraham, peace be upon him, he had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. And even in the Bible, it mentioned that the wife, same thing in the Quran. So Isaac, peace be upon him, Ishaq, is the son of Sarah, peace be upon him. And Ishmael, is the son born from Hajra, peace be upon him. So both of them were sons of Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, and both are prophets of God. We have to respect and love both of them. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. My question is kind of related to the one uh, the sister started asking and the, the other one who uh, commented on uh, picking good things in religions. See. Uh, I believe, I believe uh, Islam is part of this continuous chain of religions, like if we're talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In order to be a Muslim, you have to believe first in Judaism and Christianity. My question is, like the Samaritans and the crucifixion of the Christ, like, uh, I mean, let me say the, the Islamic story about the crucifixion of the Christ, in other words, and uh, I believe that it's, you know, w once this issue is uh, clarified, we'll have no more major differences, like gaps will just turn off. Let me ask the question, he has posed two parts of the question, that a Muslim can only be a Muslim first if he believes in Judaism and Christianity and then Islam, which I disagree, brother. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, Inna dina in the la al-Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. So what Moses, peace be upon him, preached was nothing but Islam. He never preached Judaism. What Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, preached was nothing but Islam. He never preached Christianity. The word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. Do you know that? The word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. The first time the word Christian is used in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts it says that the people of Antioch, they called the followers of Jesus Christ as Christians. It was a nickname given by the people of Antioch. Jesus Christ, peace be upon never heard the word Christian in his life. Do you know that? So where did he teach Christianity? So for you to say a Muslim should first follow Judaism, Christianity, then Islam is totally wrong. In Nadina in the Lahir Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. What all the messengers preached is nothing but Islam. These what you find, the Bible and the other books, they are the corrupted form of the original revelations. Now coming to your question. That what is the Islamic version of crucifixion? What is Islam has to say about crucifixion? Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 157, that they said and boast that we kill Jesus, the son of Mary, the Jews, they said and boast, we kill Jesus, son of Mary. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It was only made to appear so. And all those who differ are full of doubts. With only conjecture to follow. For a surety, they killed him not. So according to the Quran, the Jews said in boast that we killed Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But they killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It was only made to appear so. And all those who differ are full of doubts with only conjecture to follow. For a surety they killed him not. So according to the Quran, we believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not crucified. It was only made to appear so. And I've had a debate on was Christ really crucified. Crucifixion means a person should die on the cross. And in my debate, I've proved that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not die on the cross. So we don't have an English term for a person who's put on the cross, but does not die. So the new word that we can coin is crucifixion. 
F I C T I O N fiction not fiction not F I X I O N so what we believe that it was a crucifixion C R U C I F I C T I O N but it was not crucifixion F I X I O N because I proved in my talk that he did not die on the cross to cut it short to make the christian realize in one nutshell how to prove that jesus christ peace be upon him did not die on the cross he was not crucified when jesus christ peace be upon him was asked by the people that oh master show us some signs so he replies in the gospel of matthew chapter number 12 verse number 38 he says you evil and adulterous generation you ask me for a sign no sign shall be given except the sign of jonah for as jonah was 3 days and 3 nights in the belly of the whale so shall the son of man be 3 days and 3 nights in the heart of the earth now anyone who is a christian he knows the sign of jonah he has to go to the book of jonah it is only one page only two sides and when you ask any christian about the sign of jonah they will tell us that jonah was asked by almighty god to go to nineveh to deliver the message but he runs away from the commandment and goes to joppa so here while he's traveling in the ship there's a storm so it was a thinking at that time that the storm is due to a person has not obeyed to the commandment of his lord so they draw lots so jonah peace be upon him he volunteers and says i have run away from the commandment at that time it was a thinking that if they throw the person overboard in the sea the sea would become calm so they take jonah and they throw him overboard now when they throw jonah overboard was he dead or alive was he dead or alive he was alive when he goes in the sea normally in a raging sea in a storm a human being ought to die but jonah does not die peace be upon him he's alive a fish comes and gobbles him up when the fish gobbles him up was jonah dead or alive he was alive if he dies it's not a miracle he is alive it's a miracle 3 days and 3 nights the fish takes him around the ocean the man ought to die because of suffocation he does not die it's a miracle the fish vomits him out on the shore he ought to die he does not die it's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle of a miracle he is thrown overboard he does not die a fish comes and gobbles him up he does not die Three days and three nights, he roams in the belly of the fish. He does not die. He is vomited out. He does not die. A miracle of a miracle of a miracle. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, when you ask a Christian, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in the sepulcher, in his grave, for three days and three nights, was he dead or alive? Was he dead or alive? the christian tell us he was dead but then there's a contradiction for him to fulfill the prophecy of the sign of jonah he has to be alive so only on this one prophecy there are various ways i can prove he was not crucified it proves that jesus christ peace be upon him did not die on the cross he was alive so based on this we can prove from the bible that jesus christ peace be upon him he did not die on the cross jesus christ peace be upon him puts all his eggs in one basket He says no sign shall be given except the sign of Jonah for as Jonah was 3 days and 3 nights in the belly of the whale so shall the son of man be 3 days and 3 nights in the heart of the earth and further if you analyze even 3 days and 3 nights it is not fulfilled because on friday he is put on the cross so before saturday comes he is put down he is in the grave when when he is put in the grave he is put on friday night he is there on Saturday full day, Saturday night, Sunday morning is out. So it's two nights and one day. So even the prophecy of three days and three nights is not fulfilled. But surely, if he has to fulfill the other way, like Jonah, he has to be alive. And I've given various arguments from the Bible and proofs that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. You can take my video tape. I had a debate with an Arab Christian, an Iraqi Christian. was christ really crucified and i proved there that he was not crucified he was raised up alive hope that answers the question the next question from a non muslim brother here on this mic hi as a thank you very much for answering all the questions for your patience it's very very helpful 
I just have another question. Uh, the first verse that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was Ikra Bismikaya, read in the name of your Lord who created. Now the question is, um, if the angel Gabriel said to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that read in the name of your Lord, right? One scenario could be that he was reciting and he was asking Prophet Muhammad to, peace be upon him, to recite after him, yeah? But the answer of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was, I cannot read, right? Now, that shows that the angel was actually showing him something which was written, because if he was just repeating, if, if the angel was just saying something and was just asking the Prophet to just recite after him, it doesn't require the Prophet to know how to read or write, yeah? It's just repeating. Yeah, so that means it was actually something written that the angel was wanting the prophet to read. And hence his reply was that I can't read. Yeah, so, but we know that the Quran was not written, it was later that it was compiled into a form of a book. But the first sentence kind of suggests that there was something written at the first place. So uh, w w what do you suggest in this? That was the question that when the first word was revealed, Ikra, the Prophet said, Man, I am not learned. I cannot read. So he's assuming that that means something written was shown. It's not a must. For example, if there's a person here, even if I tell him that read, even if I don't show him something, he will say that I am illiterate or I cannot read. It's not necessary I have to show him something. Fine? It may be, it may not be. It's not a must when I'm asking someone to do something that I have to show something. I can just say, why don't you read? It's not much that I should show him something. So a person who cannot read may voluntarily come and say that I cannot read. It's not necessary to tell you, okay, show me what to read. Oh, this thing. No, this thing I can't read. So even if you don't show me when I cannot read, so what is the use of you showing me that thing? If someone tells me read Japanese, I'll say I cannot read. I'll not say, okay, where is it? Show me where is Japanese. If you tell me, brother Zaki, read Japanese, I'll say, what to read? Show me Japanese. I say I cannot read Japanese. Correct? Do you get it? Now we would uh, even start the session of one slip and one question on the mic. The next question, there's a question from Brother Rajesh. He says, Quran is a holy book from Allah and it has been written by Allah himself. If Bible matches a lot with the Quran, then who is the writer of the Bible? There is a connected question about the similar topic. This is from Mrs. Khan. My staff questions me that since the Bible came first, the Quran is taken from there rather than copied in certain aspects. Please help to clarify this. As far as the first question is concerned, that if Quran is the word of God and many things of the Bible match with the Quran, that means who is the writer of the Bible? Is God the writer of the Bible? We agree that Quran is the word of God. No, whatever matches with the Quran, that portion we do not mind as accepting to be the word of God. But that does not mean that the whole of the Bible is the word of God. What we believe that Injil was a wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But since it was meant for that time and only for those people, Almighty God did not feel it fit to preserve it. But Quran, since it is the last and final revelation, Almighty God says in Surah Hijar, chapter 15, verse number 9, we have revealed the Quran and we shall guard it from corruption. So, today Quran is the Furqan, the criteria to judge right from wrong. So whatever matches with the Quran, we say, this portion we have got no objection in accepting to be the word of God. So if you ask me, who is the author of the Bible? So today the Christian scholars, they say that there are various different authors of each book. The Bible is derived from the Greek word Biblos meaning the book of books. So the present Bible, according to me and according to scholars, it is a mixture. It does contain in some places the word of God that is remnants of the Injil. It even contains the word of the prophets. It even contains words of historians. Unfortunately, it even contains pornography. It's a mixture. So who's the author? Many human beings also wrote, according to the Christian scholars, John, Matthew, it is gospel according to John, gospel according to Matthew, 
gospel according to Luke. What Quran says is gospel according to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. What we believe in the Injil, which was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But what the Bible contains is gospel according to Matthew, gospel according to Mark, gospel according to Luke, gospel according to John. What we believe is gospel of Jesus, peace be upon him. So even the Christian scholars say, this has been written by human beings. So we cannot attribute the complete Bible as the word of God. Regarding the second part of the question asked by the other sister, that one of the staff says that if Bible came first, that means the Quran has been copied from the Bible. Yes, it can be one of the ways. But second also can be that if there are similarities, maybe the source is same. So part of the material of the Bible is matching with the Quran. So that part of the Bible will match with the Quran. The source can be same. That is Almighty God. But to say that it has been copied, the same way you have to say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, copied from the Old Testament and the Christian will say no. What we believe that the basic message of all the revelations is the same about Tawheed, believing in one God. So this message is the same. But imagine, there are hundreds of scientific errors in the Bible. Now, if you say it has been copied and people assume, knows Billah, that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, copied the Quran from the Bible, that means Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he corrected scientific errors, he didn't copy. That means he was a great scientist. So while copying the Bible, the Bible says the light of the moon is its own light. The Quran says the light of the moon is reflected light. Bible says in Genesis chapter number 1, Verse number 16 to 19, light of the moon is own light. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 61, light of the moon is reflected light. So, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he took the Bible and he corrected it. And he said, no, 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 it's not only reflected light. It's not possible. There are many things mentioned in the Quran which science has discovered today. Quran has mentioned 1400 years back. So, no human being can write such things what is mentioned in the Quran. So, surely we cannot, and if you refer to my talk on Quran and the Bible in the light of science will get more details that it surely disproves that Quran cannot be copied from the Bible. It is a Furqan. It is a criteria to judge right from wrong. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. My name is Paul. I live here and I'm a manager. I have about three parts I want to ask you. Um, I've been storing it up for three hours. The first one is there are two types of death. There's a spiritual death and there's a physical death. And a brother was asking about uh, if you leave Islam, um, you should be put to death for this. Um, in the Christian Bible, God says, if you don't know me, I don't know you. And I think those simple words sum up a spiritual death, that when the person who has chosen to ignore God and is standing before God on judgment day, God will just simply say, you didn't know me and I don't know you. That is a spiritual death. I just say that as a comment. My wife and I were walking through the streets of Dubai and we were past a CD and a book about Islam. I've moved from Singapore. I'm British, but I've lived in Singapore for 23 years. I've rubbed shoulders with many Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. And I'm pleased to say I've learned more about my fellow mankind having been away from Britain than ever I would have learned in Britain. This thing that you're doing tonight is wonderful. And I wish I had had this many years before. One of the signal absences in this treatise on Islam was Nobody talked about the devil, nobody talked about sin, and I was puzzled because in Christianity it is always constantly the fight between good and bad. In the Old Testament, which was the first thing that I learned, there were a lot of similarities with Islam. People are slaughtering cows and sheep and goodness knows what to atone for their sins. And the more I, I gather, the worse the sin, the more animals that were killed. And in the big temple courtyards, there were just vast areas for burning these animals on the altars. Why has that stopped? If Islam is drawing 
on a lot of the Old Testament things, what I know as the Old Testament. Abraham had a wife called Sarah. How do you know this? You know it because it was recorded. Would you agree, therefore, in the New Testament that the uh, people who wrote and recorded those things, are they telling the truth? I'm asking you a question which I hope you'll answer in a minute. Are they telling the truth or is this made up? And therefore, why are we not even today slaughtering animals left, right and center to atone for our sins because there is another forgiveness? The last point I want to make is I was absolutely amazed, I learned this in Singapore, that there were historians at the time Jesus was observed to have been crucified who were not Christians. There was no reference to what religion they had, but they recorded that this man Jesus lived. Yes, we know he lived. You acknowledge as Muslims that he lived, but he was observed to have been crucified. And it is recorded in the Bible by the same people who I'm asking you, do you believe that Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John existed? Was this a made-up story? Because if all the other things have been observed, Jesus said this or Jesus said that in the red writing in the Bible, um, where is the line between something happened and something didn't happen? I'm sorry, it's a long question. No wrong. I answer the question. The brother asked a very good question. He said that in my talk, for example, I mentioned that Abraham had another wife by the name of Sarah. May peace be upon them. How did I come to know? From the Bible. So he's asking me that many things of Islam, there are similarities in the Old Testament. Now, when we go to the New Testament, how do I pick and choose? Why don't I believe in the writers? Brother, anything, whether it's part of the Old Testament or New Testament, whether it's part of a Hindu scripture or any other scripture, I, as a Muslim, I consider, as far as I'm concerned, I'll come up with the others later on, as far as, as the Muslim is concerned, this Quran is my Furqan. Furqan is the criteria to judge right from wrong. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Balligu anni walau aya. Propagate even if you know one verse. And there is no problem if you quote from the scriptures of the Ahli Kitab. Now, as far as the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are concerned, there are three rules to be followed. Rule number one, if it matches with the Quran, we have got no objection in accepting that portion to be the word of God. Point number one. Point number two, if it goes against the Quran, we reject it. It cannot be the word of God. Irrespective who wrote it, Paul, Matthew, Mark, John, whoever. Rule number one, if it matches with the Quran, because this has been proved to be the word of God as far as we are concerned. Scientifically, everything. Even a logical person, if he finds out this is the word of God, and then if he compares whatever matches with the thing which has been proved, like this is our ruler. You know, we have a measuring tape. Once it has been confirmed this is correct, then we use this as a furqan, as our mizan. So what is there in the Old Testament, New Testament, Buddhist scripture, Hindu scripture, what matches with the Quran, we have got no objection accepting that is the word of God. What is contrary to the Quran and the Sai Hadith, we reject it, it can't be true. Now what is not matching with the Quran, but not even contradictory, it is optional. Do you understand optional? Optional means may be right, may be wrong. So those things which are mentioned in the Bible, Old and New Testament, which match with the Quran, is what I quoted today, 100%. We have got no objection in accepting this portion of the Word of God. There are many things which go against the Quran, which I can give a talk on differences between Islam and Christianity. There are certain things which are optional. Neither go against the Quran, is neither matching with the Quran. So these portions which is neither going against the Quran or matching with the Quran are optional for us. So those writings which go against the Quran, I cannot accept as the word of God. So all those authors of the New Testament, which go against the teachings of the Quran, I reject it. What matches, I say can be the word of God. What doesn't match, neither goes against, is optional. As far as a non-Muslim is concerned, we use logic. If you keep the Quran aside, today, due to advancements of science and technology, Today, the age of science and technology. Now, if you use the yardstick of science and technology to the Bible, 
you will find hundreds of mistakes about the creation of the universe. There's a mistake. The Bible says, as I mentioned earlier, that Almighty God in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 16 to 19, He created two great lights. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. So, moon doesn't have a light of its own. It's a contradiction. It's a scientific error. There are various such errors. Various. Only in Genesis chapter number 1, you can find plenty errors. There are mathematical contradictions. There are scientific errors. There is obscenity. So, leave aside Quran. Even if a normal human being who keeps his mind open and reads, we can surely not agree. This portion can surely not be the word of God. If there are scientific errors, if there are contradictions, if there's pornography, any normal human being who has an open mind will never accept this thing to be the word of God. The remaining things become optional. So this is what we use, brother, as a strategy to identify. So a student of comparative religion, whenever he picks up a scripture, he uses the strategy and he tries and reads the scripture and then he analyzes how good, how authentic is the scripture, brother. So this if we use with the Bible also, you find there are many errors, there are many contradictions. Even if you don't have the Quran, a normal human being cannot accept this to be the word of God as a whole. But because Quran says that there was a revelation given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, what we say, that portion which matches with the Quran, we have got no objection accepting as the word of God. Hope that answers the question, brother. It partly answers the question. The point I was trying to get to was about sin and the devil. The point I made was in the Islamic literature I was given, there was barely any reference to sin, the forgiveness of sin, the condemnation that we would all feel if we had no way to be forgiven for our sin. This was one part of the question. I'll just, therefore, one question at a time, it will be better. Yes. As you told that you gave a short speech, I was trying to... Yes, cover as much as I could. I apologize for my no long problem, question. No problem, brother. So, brother, that was a question that the literature that was given to him, that literature did not contain sin. So, I don't know which literature was given to you. But if you read the Quran, the Quran also speaks about sin. It speaks about hell. It speaks about punishment. Now, the literature that was given to you may be a particular topic. Like today's talk, I never spoke about sin because the topic was similarity between Islam and Christianity. But I've given other talks which speak about sin. So the literature that was given to you, brother, was maybe dealing in a particular specialized subject. It may not be dealing with sin, but to say that Islam doesn't speak about sin is wrong. So Quran, like the Bible, all speaks about sin. But the difference in the Bible and the Quran, what the church teaches about the original sin, Quran doesn't believe in that. Which I gave Dansal earlier, which I don't intend repeating, that nowhere does the Bible speak about the original sin. It is the teaching of the church. So Quran does not speak about original sin. And like the Bible, as the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter number 18, verse number 20, that the soul that sins shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Similarly, the Quran says, no bearer of burden can bear the burden of others. If you commit a sin, you will be responsible. No one else can bear the burden. So Quran also speaks about rewards, speaks about punishment, speaks about sin, various things. In my talk, though I didn't mention sin, but indirectly I did mention also about sin. If you have alcohol, it's a sin. If you have pork, it's a sin. If you do adultery, it's a sin. But I was speaking in the positive aspect. Don't have alcohol. Don't have pork. Don't do adultery. So even the Quran speaks about sin. Hope that answers the question, brother. The next question from the slip is from Brother Sven Bensler. You mentioned a lot of references of the Bible. What about John 10.30? The Father and me are one. The Brother quote a verse of the Bible, Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 30, the Father and me are one. It is not the Father and me are one, it is I and my Father are one. It's not the Father and me are one. Now this quotation, I and my father are one. To know what it is, you have to know the context. You have to understand the context that I and my father are one. To know this, you have to go a few verses earlier. If you read Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 23, it speaks about the context that the Jews, they entered the temple in Solomon's porch, verse number 23. Verse number 24 says that the Jews came upon Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and they asked him, how long does thou make us doubt? If thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. 
verse number 25 says, I have told you, but you believe not in me. The work that I do, they bear witness of my father. Verse number 26 says, you do not believe in me because you are not my sheep. Verse number 27 says, my sheep, they hear me and they follow me. Verse number 28, I give them eternal life. No man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse number 29 says, my father that give it to me is greater than all. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. So in context, it means in purpose. Verse number 28 says that no man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse number 29 says, my father is greater than all. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand. Verse number 30, I and my father are one. So it means they are one in purpose. If I say my father is a medical doctor and he's a doctor, I'm a medical doctor and my father are one, it means we are one in profession. It does not mean one in person. But the Christians say, no, no, it means one in person and my father are one, indicates that Jesus Christ, peace be upon his God. If I agree for sake of argument, further if you read in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 21, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, my father is in me and I in thee. He tells his apostles, to his 12 apostles, my father is in me, I and thee, and we are one. The same one is used here. So do you mean to say there are 14 gods now? Father is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is in the apostles. So there'll be 14 gods. So you have to coin a new word. Instead of Trinity, you have to coin a word for 14 gods. Here what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, meant the same one was used, that one in purpose. And further it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 23, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he tells the apostles that I am in you and you and me, we are one. That means one in purpose. And immediately you read further, Gospel of John chapter 10, verse number 31, the Jews, they pick up stones to stone Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Verse number 32, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him says, many of good works have I done, for which of my good works do you stone me? Verse number 33, See, all this is from my head. Any Christian who has the Bible can open and check up all the references I'm giving. Gospel of John chapter number 10 verse number 33 says that we don't stone you for good works. You being a man, you blaspheme is saying I am God. Verse number 34 says that isn't it mentioned in your scriptures that ye are gods and the one to whom the word of God comes is called as God. Your scripture is not broken. So here if you read in context that I and my father are one is in purpose. It doesn't mean that they are one in unity and it doesn't claim at all that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God. Otherwise, it would mean that there are 14 gods. So what it means is that the purpose of Almighty God and Jesus Christ, the messenger of God, is one and the same. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Rahul again. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me the chance again. Uh, just another question I had in mind. Uh, Dr. Naik, coming from India, uh, you would, I suppose you know about uh, when it comes to marriages in India, they do horoscope matching before going ahead with the match. Uh, I know that this is strictly forbidden in Islam, but I just want to know, is this categorized as shirk or is it just makru and something that you should try not to get into? Well, this question is as far as reading horoscope, reading the future and the kundli, it's a Hindu culture. Is it shirk or is it haram in Islam? Is it only simple haram or shirk? It's mentioned in the Quran, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 90, about fortune telling. It's haram. It is prohibited. It is a big sin in Islam. Hope okay. that's the question. Okay. Thank you so much. Next question from Carolina D'Souza on the question slip. In your talk, you singled out Jesus as a very unique person. Then you emphasized how Moses and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, were mortals. Doesn't this comparison make Jesus more special? The question posed by the sister is that when I spoke about Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in comparison, I proved that Muhammad and Moses, peace be upon him, they were mortals. Doesn't it make Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, special? Special, yes, but not God. Special, yes. He's a special messenger. Every messenger was given a speciality. A speciality. Like Moses, peace be upon him, he is called as Kalimullah, that Almighty God spoke to him. So in that way, he was special. Same way, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was special because he was born miraculously without any male intervention. Because Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born miraculously without male intervention, he was special. But that does not make him God. You know what people say? 
normally some of the Christians. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He had a mother, he had no father. So who's the father? The Almighty God. So just because he had no worldly father, if it makes him God, the reply is given in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59. It says, Inna masala isa in the like masala adam halakam min turab summa kala laukun fayakun That the similitude of Jesus is the same of Adam, peace be upon him. He was made from dust and said, be it was. If you say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Almighty God, because he had no father, then Adam, peace be upon him, according to the Quran and the Bible, he had no mother and no father. So do you mean to say he's a greater God? <laughs> so it is just a miracle of Almighty God. That does not mean Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God. Neither does it mean that Adam, peace be upon him, is God. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. My name is... Neto Raymond. I work in Dubai as a salesman. Now my question is just on fasting. I just want to know how somebody can control himself by fasting from morning up to in the evening. We know very well that Jesus himself fasted for 40 days. And yet you say that Muslims are more Christians than Christians themselves. We are asking the question that Muslims, we fast from dawn to sunset, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, fasted for 40 days. You say that. 40 days. There is no mention of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, fasting for 40 days in the Quran. And even the Christians, when they fast, they don't fast like the Muslims do. They have a different sort of fasting, depending on which sect you belong to. Some sect for fasting is not having non-veg. Some sect, they have only boiled food. So there are different sects in Christianity which fast in different ways. I don't know of any sect in Christianity which fast for 40 days. If they fast, they may have, okay, no non-veg, only vegetables, that's their type of fasting. Some fasting is only having boiled food, that's their fasting. There are different types in different sects, but I don't know of any sects in Christianity which fast like the Muslims or neither, like they fast for 40 days continuously, like the way you're saying. Hope that answers the question, brother. The next question on the slip is a short information question from Ansari Iman. Ask for Dr. Zakir Naik's email ID. The email ID foundation islam at irf.net and my personal id is zakir at irf.net you can go to our website www.irf.net irf is a short form of the organization islamic research foundation where do you get your books sold in dubai which bookshops from zina you can go on the net and alhamdulillah all the books are available on the net it is free for downloading, there are material for Dawa. There are books available, I don't know the address where it's available in Dubai, but there are available if you go to Bombay, I know, and here there are some people have reprinted. I personally don't know the address, but you can go to the website and surely download all the material on the net, it's for free. Yes, brother, short question in two lines, please. Yeah, yeah. you see, we believe that Amanto uh, wa Kutubai wa Rusulai, this is in Islam. Is it the same in Christianity? Do they believe in our Prophet and do they believe in our uh, book that is Quran? Because the question, what he quoted is the verse of the Quran which I quoted in my talk from Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177, that to believe in Allah, believe in the last day, believe in the angels, believe in the books and believe in the messengers. He's asking that do the Christians also believe in the messenger and the books? Yes. What the Christians believe, the Jews, Christians and Muslims, the Jews believe in all the prophets that came before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The Christians, they take a step forward and they say that we also believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him and the Injil. So all the prophets what Jews believe, the Christians believe, but they believe in additional prophet by the name of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. What the Muslims do, we take a step forward and we say believe in the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and the last and final revelation, the Quran. So all the messengers with the Christian believe and all the messengers and the books the Christian believe, we Muslims believe. But the Christians do not believe in the last and final message, the Quran, and the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So we tell them, take a step forward. There is prophecy of the last and final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in your scriptures. Take a step forward and accept him and come to the straight part of Deen al-Haq. Hope that answers the question, brother. With the last question of the day from Brother Muhammad Uwais, one of my non-Muslim friends asks about verse 9, 
29 of the Quran where Allah orders to fight against non-Muslims until they believe. He asks, is it not arrogance? One of the non-Muslim friends has asked this person, is it not arrogance? The question posed is, the verse of the Quran says, fight until they believe. Is it not arrogance? We have to read in context. If you read the context, it says that fight until there is no transgression. But once the transgression is over, we have to stop. So if you read in context all the verses of the Quran that speak about fighting, including Surah Tawbah, Surah Anfal, immediately after it says that peace is better. Even Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, that fight wherever we find the kafir in the battlefield, it says, but if the mushrik wants peace, don't just give it to him, export him to a place of security. So all the places that talk about fighting, that is jihad fi sablillah or kital fi sablillah, it mainly, if you analyze, it is in the battlefield that they're fighting or what they're doing kital is against oppression, is against transgression. It also continues that if they want peace, peace is the best. So you have to read in context and then you understand the real meaning. Hope that answers the question. Brother Arif Dulpar will propose the vote of thanks. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I really have the pleasure to thank uh, all of you, dear sisters and brothers, for being here tonight. And I pass my thanks to our dear guest, Dr. Zakir Naik, and his brother, Dr. Muhammad Naik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran. Salah is our medicine that soothes our waking limb. Salah is our vehicle that carries us through life. Salah is our soldier that fights for good and right. Salah is our garment that covers and conceals. Salah is our therapy that lifts our mood and heals. Salah is our pillow that gives us rest and peace. Salah is our sustenance.